So we're going to use the uh, model that the economics uh, department used. Uh, we're going to start with questions from a number of graduate students and postdocs that are on the panel, and then the floor will be available to everybody in the other students, other faculty. So uh, let's get started. No? Okay. Um, okay, so, sorry. One of the themes I sort of took away among many from the talk is uh, in the first half, you're looking at sort of an L infinity worst case analysis. And, and towards the end, you're looking more at an average case analysis. And I wonder, um, you know, there's lots of methods, like for instance, the simplex method. We would never use it under a worst case analysis. It's, but we know it works well, and it was only the average case analysis by Spielman that came after to sort of justify that. I wonder if you look back at the computation under different constraints under an average case analysis, does that sort of, um, do, you th do you expect to get better results, or do you expect to that uh, some practical approaches were eliminated under a worst case analysis? Okay, yeah, well, if the question is going to be that good, I'm in trouble. Um, uh, great question. Um, so let me just clarify a little bit, which is that a risk function, of course, has got a loss function, and then it's got this thing you know, the, uh, that we added after, which, which is the supremum, right? Um, if the loss function is L infinity, you're making kind of a very worst case kind of loss, right? So you're being very stringent in your loss. Um, you don't have to do that. I was kind of arguing in my pr uh, introductory remarks that that's often an appropriate thing to do in many problems. But like false discovery rates is a kind of a loss where you're being a little more forgiving but not super forgiving. And there's just a whole bunch of losses. So uh, you should think of statistics as kind of giving you a range of things from what, you know, that are very worst case to not so worst case. And you know, L2 is, uh, is, is not very stringent, for example. Right? Okay, all that said, then having done that, there was that supremum outside, yeah. all right? I, you're probably, so, you know, maybe you're referring to that, and probably That's you are, but, but, um, but yeah, so that one is, um, is, is in some sense problematic, let's be honest. Um, and if, if you're Bayesian, what it's doing, it's kind of an objective Bayes kind of thing to do, uh, which is that, um, you know, if I took the, 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 the actual loss function as a function of P and I integrated that under some prior, right? That gives me the Bayesian version of the statistical decision theory. It's a, it's a single number where I got it, you know, because I cared about some p's more than others, and I just built that in as a prior. And the worst case is kind of just taking the worst prior. Okay, so it's protecting you against you know not choosing a very good prior. So it's not so bad to argue that. And then if you see in problems like the 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 denoising problem, uh, you know, uh, Donahoe and Johnston were able to show you got these extremely useful rates out of this, this assumption. So it looked not so bad for, you know, surprisingly that Minimax is still alive after all these years, okay? Mm -hmm. All that said, as we move forward, uh, there is very much a need to get rid of that supremum and not just go fully Bayesian, where you just leave it up to the user to put in their own prior and, and integrate over it. Um, and so I really like the Spielman and Tang kind of framework, the, the, the um, smoothed analysis framework. Um, and um, I really think that's very pregnant for possibility to kind of think about that statistical inference problem from that point of view. And I, you know, maybe you're aware of it having been done. I'm not, but I think it's really, really going to be a productive thing to think about going forward. So, great question. Okay, so um, I'm currently working on Bayesian nonparametric models, um, and it seems to fit well in some respects with the big data paradigm. Um, it can grow, the parameter space can grow with your data. Uh, my question is why it, it doesn't seem like there isn't much literature as far as Bayesian nonparametrics and big data, and why isn't that the case? That's a, another great question. Yeah. So Bayesian nonparametrics, for those of you who are not in the end club here, is uh, you know, um, is it, it's nonparametrics and statistics. Of course, doesn't mean no parameters. It means the kind of the opposite: large, infinite numbers of parameters, open-ended numbers of parameters. As you get more data, the statistical model liberates degrees of freedoms and and gets richer and richer as you go. And that spirit is, is exactly right for the big data era. Uh, if you start to look at real data uh, at a large scale, you see all these heavy tail things where new phenomena keep emerging, and little, little subgroups you never saw before, and so on. And so the Bayesian nonparametric paradigm is perfect for that. And the, the gotcha is that Bayesian methods integrate instead of taking, you know, uh, optimizing. And integration, you know, large high scale dimensional integration, seems challenging right now. And so, in fact, my whole talk, I, I do a lot of Bayesian stuff too, was there's no Bayes in it. And it's just because. It, it's hard to find algorithms that are scalable, and it's hard to find theoretical guarantees for them that exist. 
Um, and I, I do not believe that's the end of the, the story. So I believe that uh, well-tailored hierarchical Bayesian models that really are well-matched to the problem domain that spawn off clusters at the right rates and all that uh, and have a large amount of data will actually mix much faster than anyone has any right to believe. It just hasn't been tried out. Everyone's doing all this deep learning stuff and, you know, and all that and aren't just trying out really, really large-scale Bayesian non-parametric models that you know, Google and Facebook and so on. Maybe I'm sure people are. I'm just not as aware as I should be. We're trying and something. <laughs> you guys are trying something. And I, I suspect it's possible, just like with hidden mark models, you, you do once through the database or twice mm -hmm. and you're done. It converged. Like, the theory would have never predicted that. But it, because kind of if you get a little bit of data that gives you a little bit of power on some parameter, mm -hmm. that feeds over the tide parameter over here but because of the model, and immediately you have a very tight prior on whatever little bit of data you have over here. And so that may be much, much more uh, mixy than you might expect. Uh, that's just kind of a wild hope, but I kind of am betting on that as time goes on. Um, Jamie from Department of Biostatistics here. Okay. Um, thank you for your um, very informative and thought-provoking talk. Um, I think we will talk about um, a lot about the curves of di dimensionality. Mm -hmm. um, so what would be um, some blessings of high dimensionality in your opinion? And if they exist, how could statisticians take advantage of these blessings? Okay, yeah, great question. I mean, I, I, I don't um, work that much on the latest era of high dimensional statistics myself, but mm -hmm. a lot of my friends and colleagues do. Um, and they're kind of two stock answers. One of them is that there is a notion that it really came out of you know, f geometric functional analysis, you know, analyzing Lipschitz functions on spheres kind of to think, you know, um, that these objects amazingly concentrate uh, in high dimensions in such a way that they really simplify as you get to higher and higher dimensions. And so like a range of things that can happen and doesn't grow exponentially, it actually quite the opposite. It, it, it shrinks and concentrates. Uh, and so that's now well appreciated, you know, it, it, it has a parallel in, in probability theory in terms of large deviation analysis and so on. Um, but. Um, you know, I, if you want, like, you know, version in at Michigan has got very nice lecture notes. And Dovoretsky is an you know, important figure in this field. If you haven't read about that yet, you should. It's the, it'll, it'll continue to dominate a lot of people's thinking. Um, so there are, there are clear mathematical blessings of dimensionality, and they can and should be exploited. Um, and then tied to that is the notion of sparsity and other some notion that we, you know, just because uh, we had a simple geometry and gave us a blessing, and maybe that's not enough, maybe we, um, will impose like we you know, we live on a subspace. Uh, we don't know that you know the number of coefficients is, uh, that are non-zero is small and so on and so forth. Uh, those two things collaborate. The mathematical analysis of uh, sparsity imposing systems uses concentrations. Um, but that's still very, that's been now 10, 20 years of, in statistics at least, a uh, very productive relationship. Um, you know, showing either that there's a blessing or that the, the worst case thing can be mitigated because uh, kind of surprisingly um, it's possible to impose an optimization on sparsity and get make, make it still be attractive to optimization and have and have it capture the statistical phenomenon. So I didn't say anything particularly exciting there, but I just uh, uh, cursor dimensionality is still will always be present, but it, but it's kind of been mitigated. Hi, um, I'm Ian Mouser from BioSess department. Um, I think in big data area, there is some transition from hypothesis driven to data driven, like uh, instead of having the model and making a lot of assumptions uh, first, we look at the, into the data first. I'm wondering if you can share some thoughts about this. Yeah. Okay, Thank yeah, you. great question. I, I agree, it's very exploratory now, and I think that's great and that's exciting. Mm -hmm. And um, visualization technologies are needed to help that kind of process go on and, and so on. Um, but any statistical exercise is always a blend of exploratory and model-based. You don't just look at a, look at data and have the data express something, because you will see, a, a space, you know, a, you know, you always see patterns that aren't there. Humans are predisposed to that. Uh, fluctuations are present, and 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 you have to control that. So there is no, f you know, free exploration kind of thing that is not going to, you know, give you errors. Um, so it's just kind of an ongoing effort to kind of, well, let's develop a procedure which is, under certain assumptions, not going to give me too many errors, like false discovery rate is a good example. Let's do some screening. Uh, and given that, visualize, think about it, hypothesize, and then continue to work with the data, and then may perhaps go gather new data and explore it and, and, and move towards the confirmatory. Um, and then building software systems that support all those activities is very, very important. That's a lot of ongoing work there. But yeah, be, be very suspicious when someone says, well, the data spoke and I, I, I heard. You know, <laughs> that's, just non that's nonsense. 
right. So I'm Mike Hughes from Computer Science. And I guess I, you had a lot of great theoretical results in the talk. Uh, and at, at one point, at least in the, I think, the communication section, uh, the, the results there, you mentioned that you were using just an L2 loss. Yeah. And I'm just wondering how, you know, choosing the loss function is often like the most important part of these problems. And I'm wondering how easy it would be to extend the results to, to other loss functions, whether, whether you're thinking about directions in that space. Uh, yeah, most of those things aren't that hard to, to um, you know, there's kind of, for example, the Gaussian assumption, you can do other things, right. sub-Gaussians and all that. And a lot of these loss functions have local coherent, local similarities. Uh, you do a Taylor expansion on them the same uh, locally. Um, and I don't want to kind of push all this under the rug, but um, uh, typically if you work with the L infinity, it's kind of the hardest one to work with. If you can mm. do that, you're able to work with some of the others. Um, if you can't, you kind of move off to the simpler ones. Yeah. Um, so I, I would sort of say that this is kind of just a mathematician's exercise to pick, pick ones that would give you a result that is, conveys the idea um, as, as simply as possible. Mm. Um, but then uh, in real life, you want to have it as part of the design procedure. You're going to write down a loss function. Someone will be optimizing, and, and that's it. I should say a lot of this, this was a real theoretician's talk. There was a lot of lower bounds in this talk, which is kind of a, somewhat unusual for machine learning people at least. Um, and once you develop the lower bounds, you've done something great to sort of show what you can achieve, but then you've got to find an algorithm that achieves it. You need an upper right. bound, and you need an algorithm which achieves it. And there you're more free to pick losses. Uh, it's, it's, now you're looking at a specific problem, not all possible problems. Hmm. And you pick one, and you just spend time optimizing it, even though it was kind of complicated. You just let the computer you know, go, go to optimize to death. So um, there you're more free in the choice of law. in the computer science department. Um, at the beginning of, the to of your talk, uh, you started talking about how um, computer scientists a bit uh, overlooked the, uh, you know, theoretical computer scientists at least, overlooked a bit the concept of risk and statistics. Uh, and at the same time, um, statistics, statisticians didn't look at the problem of um, computational complexity. Now, the computational learning theory community look at it in some sense. and. Uh, can you say something about you know how you may think perhaps they didn't go to the heart to the yeah. heart of the questions yeah. perhaps or you know how they fell short or not? Yeah, that's, that's uh, I, I, am I find being videotaped, but I think I am. I have to be very careful here. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think I kind of hedged at that point in the talk, sort of saying, well, in computational complexity, there's no relation of risk, and I was hedging for the reason you alluded to that you know. Um, you know, Valley, starting with Valiant at all, there was an attempt to kind of make this bridge. And I, I respect that. There's a, a lot of work, great work has gone on there. Um, you know, that said, it was basically, uh, it was uh, what is essentially I would call a um, uh, empirical process theory, which says that, you know, they, there is a loss, and you say, I want to, you know, achieve a good risk. I want to, you know, uh, have my risk be smaller than epsilon with high probability. You know, that, and that's, that's classical empirical process theory. Stu Geeman was one of the earlier developers who worked on this, and many others. So he's from the 60s and 70s, you know, well before that. And what Valiant added was in polynomial time, okay? Um, and and you know that's 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 important to, to then work that out in, in some you know, some cases and see where that led. And and it really did have a big impact. Um, it, you know, it turned out there weren't that many things that were learnable in that strong sense in polynomial time. So people sort of said, well, we didn't really mean polynomial time. Forget that part of it. When they forgot that part of that, then they discovered things like VC dimension and Rademacher complexity. They go, well, that was empirical process theory. That wasn't brought in, to, that wasn't discovered inside of computer science. That was discovered by probabilists and statisticians working, and combinatorialists and so on, working in these other fields. Okay, so, and then the field kind of reoriented itself. Okay, you know, I think a lot of people ingested that fact, and that helped socially and culturally for these fields to kind of come close together. Um, you know, but then the field, you know, is just kind of not after gone so much after general arching formalisms, you know. So, and a lot of the work has been on the L, the um, zero one loss. It's all oriented towards classification. And of course, as a statistician, I think that's great. And in fact, I think many statisticians think that statistical learning theory is just uh, classification loss, you know, deepened. It's, it's, a, it's, it's made the statistical literature richer on that particular loss function. And, and because people hadn't been focusing on that, they've been focusing on L2 and other things. And that was a viral contribution. Um, 
But you know, as time has gone on, there's this richness culturally of, um, you know, you, you also have papers on matrix factorizations, on, you know, this matrix completion problem with all the sparsity stuff and all that. So, so the, the crossroads are just full of cross, cr crisscrossing things. Um, you know, but that, now we still got at this kind of fundamental, how do we get lower bounds, how do we get computational complexity results that are relevant to physics? We are not, I don't believe that that set of ideas is as fruitful as it's been, has really touched that problem. Hi, my name's Sam. I study computational biology here. Um, when you were talking about using a parameter alpha to control <coughs> privacy, um, yeah. is there a benefit to having it um, be just like unbounded from zero to infinity? Because when you're talking about um, using the uh, random zero one vectors to decide whether to send the closer or further one, um, you just you just yeah. map it to zero one with like with a logit function, um, and is that is that like optimal privacy for some value of alpha? Is that just convenient? Uh, yeah, it's a good question. First of all, uh, th yes, the differential privacy literature allows it to go from zero to infinity. Our algorithm was actually, our, our, our analysis was a local one. Uh, I think on that slide there was like, let alpha be uh, alpha you know, big O of one. And, and in fact, if you look at the analysis, when, uh, the final result, if you take alpha to infinity, you don't get anything meaningful. All right? um, you know, so uh, that's one part of the answer. The other is that, um, in some sense, it's just a parameter of convenience. You can prove privacy in terms of that parameter, and then you can plug that into the risk. So it, it is one way to express the relationship between a constraint on, on discriminability, you know, pri aka privacy, and the statistical risk. Um, if you prefer some other scale or some other notion, um, you know, you could. Uh, it's just, I, I, I do admire that literature that, you know, they, they found that that formulation, which is very worst case, you know, is a, a tube unlikely the ratio, and it's for all data sets, you know, x and x prime, um, or, or ones that neighbor, or they're close in a, in a, in a certain metric. Um, so very strong, um, you know, but, but probably, uh, you know, so, so why, is, why is it so strong? Well, if, if I take a data set where you protect my privacy level alpha one, and another data set I'm also in there, maybe or maybe not, but you protect my privacy level alpha two, anybody who glues the two data sets together in any way will protect my privacy level alpha one plus alpha two. All right, so that's an important and, and beautiful result. Um, and most other things that you think about, ad hoc methods for privacy and even information theoretic ones don't do that. When you join, you can lose your privacy. Um, so that's why, w at least we, I think we were help convinced that we should be working in that framework even though we realize it'll eventually get too strong. Um, but I think we're now m you know, motivated to think about weakenings of it that aren't, don't just give up the baby with, you know, throw out the baby with the bathwater. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you, in your talk, you focused on what I would call sort of stylized models that kind of, which makes perfect sense when you're trying to sort of get some of the, the theory in practice. But as you yeah. said, you know, we, we really want to think about building interesting, complicated models for big data sets. And in fact, if you have a big data set, you can think about models that are far more expressive and complicated than we ever could have imagined with more moderate sized data sets. And so the question is, is now our traditional, there's this traditional path in statistics and machine learning of model building and model validation and model improvement and so on. And a lot of the standard tools, from my perspective, kind of start to break down when you go have very large data sets. And so do you have thoughts on directions for making progress on, on that side of statistics to this big data regime? Uh, um, yeah, so great question. Um, uh, one way of expressing, I think, one, one path forward is that most large-scale data sets are very heterogeneous. So there's all these subpopulations, and they're occurring in unknown proportions. And so you want your estimators, you want to focus more on what I'm trying to really infer. Am I trying to infer something that goes across the subpopulations, or I don't want to get one subpopulation, or, to, or I want to just get the proportions? And, and um, um, so I want estimators that I need to, uh, to, to, that are first of all robust to the heterogeneity would be one way of going about it. So it's all these nuisance variables. That's kind of unusual. In classical statistics, there was maybe you know a vector you cared about and a vector of nuisance variables, and they were both small dimension, right? You know, now we can let the, the vector you care about get larger and larger, but I think that the vector you, the things you don't care about is way even bigger. And so we need kind of high dimensional analyses where the number of nuisance variables goes even faster to infinity. And I don't think that's a hopeless regime to be in. I think though there's kind of ways to protect yourself about that. And the actual algorithms themselves may have a kind of a clustering flavor where you peel off things and um, you know, they may have a lot of robust statistics flavor where you don't let all that competing stuff hurt you. Um, 
but that's kind of to me a nice brief area to be thinking about. Um, I mean, what in my group we've been spending a lot of time doing is just kind of the parallelization, the subsampling kind of ideas, the asynchronous distributed processing stuff, and just try to get control on that. Um, so less on the kind of the core statistical issues you're referring to. Um, but I know model building, model validation, all those things are still critical. They're just that the ideas we have now aren't immediately applicable, so maybe we put it, but they aren't wrong. And I kind of think if you think about all the, you know, split up all the nuisance variables, we kind of got to think about it uh, fresh. And then what's left is still a core part of the model you care about. You know, I'm trying to offer some service for Eric Sutter, you know, and, and, and all these other people are partly, you know, give me useful data about people like you and all, all, all kind of useless data that'll hurt me if I try to make that inference. But I, 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 I um, you know, have a well, I can make well-posed inference problems and make, and then I have to do that modeling part of the inference correctly and have control over it and so on. So if you don't know about things like false discovery rate and all that's also a very important thing, thing to know about. You know, if I have large numbers of hypotheses, um, and I could even have some heterogeneity nowadays, I could control the rate of errors across all of those things. That's kind of uh, you know, one opening door, I think, for statistics in this regime. Hi, so uh, first of all, thank you for your talk. Um, my feeling overall is that uh, your overall philosophy is that we need to unify a lot of these aspects of we have complexity theory, we have, you know, as you say, the risks from uh, statistical decision theory. And uh, in line with Professor Sutter's comment, have you considered incorporating aspects that relate to the complexity of the model, like a la Kolmogorov complexity? So, you know, it's for learning a much more complex model, it seems we would need to account for much more, you know, data account for that complexity and our ability to analyze these bounds, you know, um, to understand what's needed. Um, yeah, good question. Uh, so first of all, I, the, the, these minimax risks, uh, the family script P here, right. um, is often non-parametric and complicated. Mm -hmm. and. Um, and the tools to analyze those things involve things like hovering numbers and areas of mathematics that allow kind of growths and complexity and control over that. Um, again, Stu was a, was a leader in the early 80s in working on this sort of thing, and it's been a, become a kind of you know very important part of the statistics paradigm is to get control on non-parametric notions of complexity. So not going all the way to Kolmogorov complexity, which I, I understand right, does bring you into you know computational issues, but um, um, if I, if you were my grad student, I'd say don't do that. Don't, don't, don't bother. It's, Speaking it's, of which, uh, are you looking for grad students? Always, <laughs> <laughs> always, or even or postdocs too. Okay. Well, I'm not sure. <laughs> okay. thank you. Yeah, no, Kolmogorov did many beautiful things. In fact, if I could name some of the figures of that era, you know, Kolmogorov would be highest in the list for kind of this bridging figure. Right. Uh, he, he created the foundations of probability theory, but he also thought right. about computational complexity. Also, m Turing. Uh, it's important to remember, especially if you saw the movie lately, um, was uh, <coughs> you know created the foundations of computer science. But his, his thesis at Cambridge proved essential limit theorem, mm -hmm. and in a different way. Yeah. It didn't turn out to be different. The Russians had already done it, but um, you know. So uh, and then of course von Neumann and Wiener, et cetera. These figures, uh, I don't think would have distinguished between computing and co computational algorithmic thinking right. and inferential thinking. It was part and parcel. So they'd be surprised to come back here and say someone said, "Hey, they got to be unified." Part yeah. of why Kolmogorov's name came to mind is because it, he unified, you know, information theory and uh, complexity theory to some extent, or you yeah. know, at least drew some connections. No, so he was working hard on that stuff. At the right. end of his life, he was doing wonderful things. I just think yeah. I, I don't know enough about Kolmogorov complexity, but there's these kind of unknown machine constants even worse than a regular complexity right. theory. Yeah, absolutely. So that's not going to be, uh, I think, the way to go. Well, so. Right, right. I don't mean Kolmogorov <laughs> complexity itself. That's a I bit mean, of a problem. <laughs> right. I, obviously, you know. But something of that spirit. Something of the sort where, you the know. The length of a program is somehow relevant right, to right. complexity. I mean, yes. The feeling that we can do, you know, linear regression with uh, big data. Yes. You know, that, that should be certainly doable. And but it's, in cube, it's P cubed, and right. that's relevant. To, you know, right. Decision trees have a length of computation built into them. Like right. neural nets have a kind of a fast length of computation and these layers and so on. So yes, bringing that notion in, yeah. uh, kind of an algorithmic number of steps instead of, um, you know, complexity in terms of covering numbers, which is what we mostly focus on, is probably very valuable. Um, another way of thinking about it is these oracle complexities out of optimization theory. They say something like, your problem is complex if you need this many gradient looks to, to optimize yeah. the right. function, right? 
and that's been very productive too. So yes, there's more room for m broader notions of complexity that are not exactly classical Turing style. Thank you. Hi, Rossi Law from Biostatistics. Um, um, as a user of optimization um, sort of theory and tools, I uh, benefit a lot of from those tools you mentioned, and uh, it seems like you're, especially in the last problem, you emphasize a lot of the optimization. But I just want to ask you, uh, opinion on whether there are other at alternative tools. For example, there are tools that are mostly described as agronomic tool developments that just I mean, not, I mean, for certain of algorithms, they can be linked to optimizing a certain functions, but for certain algorithms, they're just purely computational. And of course, there will be problems like early stopping and, for example, greedy algorithm, et cetera, that can solve also related problems that you mentioned, like matrix completion, regression, et cetera. So I yeah, just wonder whether those types of, um, and where certain algorithm, they can also prove, I mean, reasonable minimax bounds, et cetera, just curious that, what do you think about the perspective of uh, just purely without optimization, thinking of just algorithms, and would that um, bring any hope to the uh, big data era? Thank you. Oh, uh, yeah, I don't know. Great. I'm, I mean, I, I'm an op I'm sort of open to anything kind of person. You know, I mean, the Bayesians don't optimize to the you know, first, you know, they, they integrate. And so sampling and Markov chain, Monte Carlo, all that is just, is just different. It, it, it's, it's a whole different class of tools. Um, now that said, in my 25-year career, uh, I've seen again and again, someone will propose some procedure. It'll be like, take some eigenvector of this or that, or do some random walk, or do you know, some clever procedure. And nine times out of 10, it turns out there's a very nice optimization formulation for it. And once you figure out what that formulation is, you can now analyze it and, and deepen it and broaden it and connect it to other things. So that may not continue on, but it's just been, the, been a fact. Um, and, you know, maybe we've swung too much that direction, but it's been a used very, you know, useful fact. So I don't know what are the class of things you have in mind. Um, you know, non-convex optimization, of course, you know, wild fr t frontier. Um, you know, eigenvectors, if you take the maximum minimal eigenvector, that's convex. Anything in between is not, but those are still useful eigenvectors. So there are non-convex problems that are, you know, you know, we can solve. Um, but yeah, I don't know how much more to say about, you know, um, about it. Ah. So those are supposed to be tough questions, so it's coming. <laughs> now just, uh, <clears throat> so big data, you know, is, uh, what is it? Um, <laughs> you know, uh, as a computer scientist, <laughs> we were already looking at big, but what is big? But in a serious way, you see various other sections of the academics or the business world using the terms, and it's almost impossible to discuss because there are very different points of view. You hear nonsense like, um, uh, we're going to replace, now that we have all the data, replace causation by correlation, or some kind of ridiculous things like this and so on. So going back to von Neumann, you know, he said that in order to have a new theory, you need to have a new theorem, like when he was 25 years old, he proved this Minimax theorem for game theory, and now we know what game theory, that theorem really captured the essence of the new field. So what would you say um, the new theorems of the era are, maybe we need another 25 years old in this audience to prove it, or if it's proved already, or what would you dream of having some results of this type that would be quintessential in some way for the field. Theorems that express the essence of it. Uh, right. Um, I got the theorem written down right here. I just don't. <laughs> I, oh, I lost it. I had it this morning in the hotel. Oh, man. I don't know. Um, yeah, I, I, great question. Um, um, I mean, th this talk was, in some, some sense, my rallying cry that such theorems will exist. I, I gave what little prototype thought experiments of what those things should look like. They should be, you know, to be lower bounds are pretty critical. They, they give you the, the best you can do, and, and they should be lower bounds in that space where there's a statistics axis and a comp computer science axis. Um, 
if you're going to give meaning to this field of data science, it's got to be that space. I don't know what else you mean by it really in an academic sense. So I want theorems of the kind we've seen in not just game theory, but in statistical decision theory and in context complexity theory, but in, refer to that three-dimensional space. Um, and so these were kind of exercises to get us started, and I, you know, I'm hoping that they'll open the door to further that kind of work. Um, let me just say, though, that I, we use the word data science at Berkeley, too, and, um, and I don't shy away from it. I mean, I believe this is all just some sound statistics. It's a 300-year-old field of trying to make decisions and do inference from data. And, you know, uh, why should this new era, just because there's more of the data, be suddenly not statistics? It's, it is. Um, and I think this is also the natural direction computer science has been tending toward for quite some time, that the computer has got to be in contact with the outside world. In the outside world, you, you're uncertain, and there's, an un, there's a generator of data. And, it's, and So, uh, you know, that's great. Um, the term data science is just a nice umbrella that many people can respond to and say, I'm that. So uh, my favorite example is, you know, a database researcher, of which I have several colleagues at Berkeley, who we kind of work together in this thing called the AMP Lab. Um, and uh, they, I, I, if I ask them, are you a statistician, even by my very broad definition of that, um, you know, they'd say no. And, and, and you know, I'd, I'd argue with them that they really are. There's always some inferential content in any query they would write down in any database. But, you know, that's just not their culture. And they, but if I ask, are you a data scientist, of course they are, yeah, because they move data around all the time, and they, could, they got all kinds of beautiful theory of you know, how to move data around and control it. Um, and taking their ideas and bringing it to ours in contact, that's fantastic. Um, and, and so and statisticians, in fact, to somewhat to my surprise, are, not, are embracing the term mostly. They, they say, yeah, I'm a data scientist. I always was, but, you know, um, but now I'm sure I am. And then many other people embrace it too, who are even further beyond. Social scientists, you know, who work with Facebook data says, yeah, I'm a data scientist. I'm not just a... So <laughs> it's, it's having the first time in my 25-year career uh, where almost everybody on a typical academic campus says, this is great. This is the future of my field. Let's get on board. Let's do something together. So far beyond, you know, the core you know, mathematical challenges, which is really great, this sociological, uh, you know, effect is really, really significant to me. And of course, there's real companies out there and real people looking, you know, for guidance in this regard. So, first time I think where whole campuses and you know can kind of come together. In fact, it's at the level of the campus where it happens. You're not going to have all the fields suddenly merge into one mega conference, right? So it's got to be individual uh, campuses doing things, and that, that to me is great. So the business people, you know, yeah, I don't talk their language either, um, and. Um, so on, but I think it's fantastic that, that, that they're interested suddenly in trying to make inferential statements and do branding and marketing with data and all that. And it'll take time, um, but that's I, and I, nothing against that. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, so we talked a, lo a lot about uh, machine learning and big data. So I have a question, because um, in big data, the data is already there for you. Um, so, but in terms of to test a real model or application for real human, yeah. uh, there may be no data at all. And so, um, let's say a field of education, and we <laughs> want to test a model for keys. And actually, it's very hard to design a control study for them because it's a little bit hard to see what feature we can collect from a user study and what keys really express is what they say. So. Um, in terms of, like, let's say, building a tutoring system for, let's say, middle school students, and we need a lot of data to make it pedago pedagogical a model. So, in classical way, there requires like um, tens of years, like user study and a lot of work to to do for just build a small data set. So, is there any way um, in the future we can try to? probably using machine learning to um, get those data. Okay, uh, great question also. I think I understand. At least I hope I can say something useful. Um, so in applied statistics, you have to think hard and long about the inference you're trying to make and what data is relevant to that and can you collect it. Sometimes it's not possible. In fact, in a kind of classical causal inference setting, in some sense it's not possible because I want to give you the treatment and not give you the treatment and see the difference. Right? It's possible. So you, you've got to get around that somehow. Um, and so you can kind of try to get around by all kinds of control and, all, and, uh, and so on. And it gets to be heavy, hard to do, and, and, and you know, um, not 
feasible. Um, so uh, is there anything in the big data area which will mitigate that? So I'm going to actually push back a little bit on Soren's comment there that so, no, yeah, yeah, just collecting huge amounts of data doesn't solve the causal inference problem at all, right? Uh, but if you're, you know, an economist um, or econometrician, what you're often looking to spend a lot of your career doing is looking around for so-called natural experiments, okay? So on one side of the river, uh, you know, Philadelphia, they had a certain change in the law, and on the other side of the river, they didn't change the law. And the, and the populations are the same. Now, this is not necessarily a good argument, but, you know, uh, let's suppose the populations were the same. Um, and now you can observe by that natural experiment, that uncorrelated with the behavior of the people, um, you saw that there was a condition imposed on similar people. Uh, that's different in two cases, and now you can try to make a causal inference. And there's even better, there's really beautiful examples, like, you know, depending on what uh, age, uh, around the year, you're, uh, what month you were born, you'll, you'll, you'll get a certain amount of schooling. And you, so you can start, uh, d you know, depending on the month you're born, and you can finish school at age 16 on your birthday, right? So you get a random amount of extra schooling depending on when you're born, month you're born into relative to when you finish. And that's unrelated with any other property of you that's relevant to your education. <coughs> it just happens to be what month you were born in. So suddenly you have a very nice natural experiment that can be interpreted causally. So you could hope, this is just a hope, and, it's, and you, know, you don't want to uh, say this on videotape, but um, mm. is that in lots of big data sets, there will be more natural experiments sitting out there, just right, right out there, for smart, causally oriented econometricians and statisticians to find. Okay. Um, um, just but they've got to be really schooled and, and, and careful about doing the matching and doing the thinking through the, the, the issue to, for that to be reasonable. Um, but I think that that's what, I hope that's what your question is getting at. I think that's very, very important. Because you need causal inferences in many situations, and people are again and again not making, you know, you pick up the newspaper, or here's some dietary thing, you look at the actual study, it was not done with causal inference, not randomized experiment, it's nonsense, nine, nine, nine times out of ten. So we got to get around it, and I, I think that, that the heaviness of the randomized experiments makes you have hope that there's other ways of going. Okay. Thank you. Hey, I'm Jillian from uh, Department of Cognitive Science. So um, I have a very um, broad question about the relationship between uh, um, of uh, big data and a human like uh, processor, because. We're talking about like uh, uh, what kind of mechanism we should use to process big data. However, as human being, every individual is processing big data every day, all the time. So I'm just uh, the, my first question is whether studying cognitive science can help us to uh, uh, to learn how big, big data should be processed. That's my first question. The second question is a related question. I have been uh, having uh, some sense of dilemma about. Um, uh, cognitive science and using statistical learning uh, method to model human behavior and human cognition. On one hand, we achieved a lot in the p past like uh, decades for uh, writing mathematical models, but on the other hand, we don't know whether those models are true. By true, I mean whether it's really happening in the human's mind. I'm just wondering, in your opinion, what would be the best the mathematical model to explain human cognition and uh, what should we do to achieve that goal and whether it's plausible? Thank you. Hey, boy. <laughs> <laughs> I thought the previous panel with all the <laughs> questions about multiple universes and all had trouble, uh, <laughs> challenging <laughs> questions, but this is, this is even worse, so, um, right. Um, so to me, cognitive science and neuroscience is the problem in the next hundred years. You know, it is fantastic to work on, and uh, I don't think we have much of a clue, really, uh, how the mind works. Um, or we're groping. I think we're kind of in the pre-Newtonian, pre-whatever, Greek era, you know, we're having very rough intuitive theories about it. And to me, what's really, what I was in it, was most interesting to me was the experimental paradigm. How do you figure it out? What experiments do you do? I mean, Roger Shepard with the rotating images, you know, that was fantastic to me because he was able to conclusively prove the brain was somehow rotating images and that was a very good methodology. Um, and then the field kind of then got into to be a little too, uh, uh, or it, you know, you know, too many fMRI experiments were done, you know, and, and so on, and so it kind of got away from that core methodology. I think that's a bit of a shame. That's what the field really needs to figure out how can you could ever decide whether certain theories are, are reasonable or not. Um, as I've gravitated more towards the kind of foundational mathematical and computational issues, um, it's been helpful for me just to leave behind the fact that human thinking works a certain way. And so, you know, just think about, um, I mean, one of, think about uh, Amazon's recommendation system. 
You know, isn't that fantastic that you go to Amazon and then you buy a few books and it starts to recommend other books to you, right? Um, that's what changes the culture. And if you, if you think about it writ large, you know, if, if, if I could go to the Twitter universe today and sort of see that people would like to have certain kind of books read and I could make that available to authors who would bid on I'll write that kind of book. We have microeconomies built on data analysis. You know, this is really going to transform our, our world and, and it's already starting to do it. Uh, and that has nothing to do with cognitive science, as far as I can tell. It's like a recommendation or a matrix completion problem. I don't think the brain does that or the mind does that. I don't think that humans are particularly good at that kind of thing. And so just thinking about the mathematical principles on how to do that, to me, turn, turns out to be very productive and useful. Um, so I think we, we expand the scope of what, you know, early AI was focused on trying to make, you know, humans with artificial mechanisms. And that was way too narrow. And I think the usefulness of Googles and Facebooks of the world is they opened up our minds to all kinds of other problems involving intelligence and algorithms and data and, and so on that, that we don't care whether humans can do it or not. It's still interesting and useful to pursue. Um, then we might get a broader scope of what intelligence is and maybe humans are one of those particular procedures to develop. So I think it's better to current era to do the math and the engineering. Um, of course, it all has to go for it. I'm not trying to say that no one should start set Putting, stop, everyone should stop putting electrodes in brains and, and doing the experimental ex educational research. But um, I just think this, this, this more mathematical field and cognitive work that was leapt forward in 20 years is amazing progress where the other fields are slower. Hi, I'm Chip Lawrence. So, um, I had the pleasure of working for NCBI, one of the early computational biology institutes. And there we often were confronted with a problem that the data we got really was poor quality. Sure. And we wound up saying data quality is very important, but who wants to do it? And data quality could be just poor measurement or it might be something malicious. Like on Fitbit, I'm Indiana Jones, I weigh 300 pounds, and I'm four foot two tall. So my question is, okay, we've taken this big data, we've taken it like it is data, but how does the issue of the quality of the data bear on the problems of inference in big data? No, uh, great, I'm glad you asked the question. I mean, I, I, um, my talk didn't focus on it at all, but of course, if you go to any industry taking in data and doing real big data analysis, you know, 90% of their work is that. Um, but if you look at actually what they are doing, uh, you know, they are using statistical principles, right? They're worrying about the bias. They're worrying about the heterogeneity. They're worrying about the sampling frame. They're worrying about all those issues. Um, and so uh, maybe it's not the cutting edge, you know, uh, and, you know, but it's critical and it's not widely enough understood and used. Um, and so really the answer there is just kind of that if more people would get a good classical statistical education, on how do you treat missing data, how do you do, you know, how do you make hierarchical models, how do you get rid of bias and all that, um, you know, that's, that's really critical. Um, so one of the things I'm doing at Berkeley right this moment is desi helping design a brand new class for f all freshmen at Berkeley to take, which would be statistical inference principles. Um, and a lot of these issues, including causal inference and including noise and data, will be part and parcel of what we're trying to teach. We're trying to teach it without any equations and like calculus and probability, the stuff that all of us grew up on. Uh, instead, letting the computer you know, do the work and seeing what happens when you make the wrong, you know, you don't clean up the data the right way and what the inferences are, you know, the inferences are wrong now and so on. Um, so I just think that's a very ongoing, long educational and technological process. Um, and, and let me just add to the previous question, like in biology, you know, it's just been fantastic hand-in-hand -hand growth with, with our field. You know, thinking about all the data cleaning issues that, you know, like a, like a Terry Speed, a statistician would work on, or a Jun Liu. And, uh, you know, together with how do you bring phylogenetic analysis or genetics together on your, you know, to, to play your inferences. You know, I can learn about the certain, you know, markers for certain diseases because of phylogeny. And again, that's not something the human evolved to do. That's what computers are made to do, right? And so, and there are fantastic issues there about, uh, so the downstream thing I was caring about was after you do all that processing, you were going to, on the basis of some genetic analysis, predict whether someone has got to have Down syndrome, a baby embryo is going to have Down syndrome or not. And you're going to deliver that to a real human being sitting, you know, and that happens a hundred thousands of times per day. And uh, so those inferences have got to be somehow under control, not just a hodgepodge. But that means the whole pipeline has got to be under control. Um, you know, 
So yeah, you've got to build the fr front ends like you're talking about, but use all the right principles, and then be honest about your error bars as they percolate all the way up. And if they became huge at the end and useless, be honest about that. So thanks. So following up the previous question, so my question is about uh, uh, inference with security against uh, adversarial input. So I've seen some reports about research on poi poisonous data, uh, specially crafted to corrupt a uh, support vector machine several years ago. And recently there are paper, papers about uh, specially crafted noise added uh, to the input to deep neural nets that can make them uh, uh, produce very high error rates. So my question is that is the um, uh, security in inference a, a, a valid question that, that is being considered or is it a non-issue given big data? Uh, or what do you think about that? Uh, no, it's a great question. Um, I do have some knowledge of colleagues who work on that set of questions. It's definitely an area, and uh, it's not one I've worked on at all, so I, I don't know much about it. Um, when I first started hearing people talking about it, I said, well, first thing you need to, learn to do is learn about robust statistics, first of all. you know, So don't calculate the mean, calculate the median if you think someone out there is throwing in bad data. And, and just take robust statistics ser more serious as a field. And I think that's another ongoing thing, effort, is to make people more aware of that. Of course, that, and that will help uh, you know, some of these issues. Um, but it doesn't solve them, and a determined adversary will get around those. Um, and so, yes, that's a fantastic area where more research is needed. And it's exactly the get a statistician and a crypto, crypto person in the same room and make them work together. I suspect that would, you know, uh, good, good things will happen, and it's really going to be necessary. I mean, yes, we in 50 years we will have a society where, you know, data is flowing everywhere through all the tubes, you know, and every one of our decisions will be made on some kind of data analysis, and bad people will be in, in you know, putting in bad data and trying to corrupt that system, um, just like they try to corrupt all our existing, you know, infrastructure. So it'll be, you know, I hate to say this, you know, this is not the field part I care about the most, but having the, the, the night, the security guards and the policemen and the modern data-oriented e economy will be necessary, sadly. Um, so yeah, definitely should be, people should be working on it now. Uh, so, one thing that came to mind, part, uh, both during your talk and answering a uh, question, uh, maybe two questions ago, talking about e uh, needing end-to-end -end assurance of, you know, the quality of your computation, um, is it seems like there's a lot of analogies between designing algorithms intended to manage statistical risk uh, and designing uh, algorithms for, you know, in the numerical methods context where you need to, you know, manage you know, bits of precision. And it's, you know, sort in some sense a dual problem. Um, mm. But it seems like maybe there's can be inspiration in how s statisticians and computer scientists can collaborate in the same way that, you know, applied math and computer science people have collaborated in the past. Yeah. Any thoughts on that? Great, great point. No, I, don't, I don't need to add to what you just said. But yeah, backward error analysis in linear algebra had a big impact on a lot of people. And I think my, my field is in, kind of affected by it. We, we view it as pretty important. Um, and, and by the end-to-end -end error propagation kind of issues and all that. Um, so yeah, I think it just, I think most of us take it as an inspiration. It does, it sometimes it immediately gives you methods that, you know, so if someone proposes a new matrix completion factorization procedure and they haven't done any error analysis, uh, you know, you kind of hold your nose until they do it because, you, you know, it's probably going to blow up numerically and a lot of us are aware of that. But, so that's been really healthy for the field and the theory is kind of interesting, but, uh, but it, it, you know, uh, numerical linear algebra definitely doesn't touch all the things, uh, the paradigm that we're interested in. It's, it's, it's uh, you know, very Hilbert space oriented. And it's not where we are typically. But, but yeah, great point. Uh, I hope to thank Professor Zhu 